Hello, welcome to Light From Above. My name is David Kenny. Glad you can watch the program with us. Today I have a special guest, Brother Glenn Hawkins. Brother Hawkins, we're glad to have you, and thanks for coming into the studio. Thank you very much. Appreciate your invitation. We are having a series of lessons at the Wadsworth Church of Christ, and Glenn has agreed to come in and record these lessons. We'll show you the brochure here. Uh, the theme is about the Christian race. Glenn, why don't you tell them a little bit about what these lessons are about? Well, the Christian race is a term that's found in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the first 11 verses, and I've developed seven lessons uh, centered around that main theme, as the brochure suggests. So that's been the focus of the meeting, how to run the Christian race and what goes along with it. Well, great. Um, just I want to show this picture. This is a picture of us together with my son. My son, he's one year old here. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's rapidly getting 18 now. But uh, these lessons you also gave at uh, Streetsboro, Ohio, the church there in 2001. And I remember him there. I was a, a member then uh, during that meeting. And I, whenever you decided uh, to uh, come to Wadsworth, um, we talked about a theme for the meeting. And I'm like, I really thought those lessons were excellent. And I said, why don't we just do those again? And so we're really glad to have you. Uh, in the studio to have them so other people can see them as well. And so we're really, we're really grateful to you for being able to come in. A little bit of information about Glenn. Um, he's, his parents, we'll talk about his father here a little bit more in a moment, uh, but he's, um, his dad was a preacher for 60 years, um, preached several different places. Glenn graduated from Newark High School. He has an AA in Bible from Ohio Valley College, which is now a university. Also has a BA in Bible. Uh, 1965 from Harding College, that's now a university, and then a Master's of Philosophy of Religion from Harding Graduate School of Religion, uh, where he attained that in 1975 under some serious scholarship there as well. Um, he has, um, he's on the editorial board of Sufficient Evidence, which is a journal published uh, to uh, a, provide a response about atheism. Uh, it's a very good paper dealing with uh, some academic arguments there. He's married to Hope, is it Schutz? Schutz, right. Schutz right. Hawkins. Shut. And she was from Parkersburg. Why don't you tell them a little bit about your lovely wife, Hope? Well, I met Hope when I went to uh, uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, uh, to enter school there at Ohio Valley College. And we met there. She and her family attended the Camden Avenue Church of Christ in Parkersburg. So uh, we started dating near the end of our freshman year and then through our sophomore year, and we both went to Harding, and uh, in the summer between our junior and senior year, we got engaged, and then uh, after we both graduated from Harding, uh, she went home to plan the wedding, and we were married on July tw uh, June 27, 1965. So we've been married uh, 52 years. We have uh, two sons. Our oldest son is married and has a, a daughter, our only granddaughter. He lives north of Atlanta. And our other son, Adam, is at home. He runs a flea market. And so uh, that's our family. And my wife uh, taught school for over 30 years and retired. And then she became a, a geriatric case manager for about 11 years and then retired after that. So. She's at home right now. Well, great. The, um, you did locator work in several different places. Of course, Maslin, you've been there for you know, many years. And why don't you tell them about some of the places that you preach at before you, and also including Maslin? Well, uh, the, first, uh, the first place that I preached at after graduating was a little town called St. Clair, Missouri, which was about an hour west of St. Louis, right off of what was all what was then the old Route 66. I was there for three years, and then I moved to Waverly, Tennessee, and I was there five years. And then uh, after that, in 1973, I moved to Memphis, where I entered the graduate school. And while I was there, I worked with the Macon Road Church uh, with Robert Brown, a uh, very close friend of mine. And then uh, in 1975, after I got my master's degree, I received a call from the church at Maslin wanting to know if I could come up there. And so uh, we moved in the summer of 1975 to Maslin, and I've been there ever since. Now, Maslin was also the place where my father preached for four years from 1952 to 1956. 
So uh, I kind of went back home for that matter. And it's been a, been a great 40, 42 years with the church there. Very good church, good leadership, good people. Great. I thought we would, uh, you mentioned in one of your lessons, of course, we were, you know, by the time these air, the gospel meeting be concluded. But I remember one of the lessons, the points you made in one of your lessons was about uh, preachers, you know, you having preachers as your heroes. And, and I thought we would talk about some of them. So let's probably start with, let's just start with the first one, your father, Jack Hawkins. Why don't right. you tell me a little bit about your well, dad? Well, uh, my father was raised in southeast Missouri in Ripley County. And shortly after he became a Christian, he decided to preach. And uh, for a few years, uh, he preached here and there. Had an opportunity to spend a little time at Harding College and also Freed Hardeman. And uh, during that time and afterward, he did a lot of mission work in the state of Louisiana. And finally, he, when he met my mother, and they married in 1942... At the time, he was in Dexter, Missouri. He was doing some preaching, but he was also selling the Dixon Bible. As a matter of fact, he was so successful in selling the Dixon Bible that uh, the boss told him that he would like for him to come and work full time and promised him a, a real good salary for that day and age. But Dad had made up his mind that he wanted to preach. So about the time I was born, he had gone to Pontiac, Michigan to uh, check the work out there, and they hired him. And so he came back, and when I was a month old, we moved from Dexter, Missouri to Pontiac, Michigan. My dad had a 27 Model A pulling a little trailer with all their worldly goods, and we went to Pontiac, Michigan. We were there, uh, he was there from 43 to 48 during the war, then to Logansport, Indiana for a couple of years, and then Monroe County, southeast Ohio here, uh, from 1949 to 1952. And then from 52 to 56, he was at Maslin, where I am now. And then we moved to Newark, Ohio, for five years, where I graduated. And then uh, Dad was in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, he was in Brookville, Pennsylvania, and spent the last years preaching for two or three churches in the Detroit area. So uh, I grew up as a, a preacher's kid, uh, and all, all that that means. But uh, he is, of course, uh, the one who had the most influence on me um, as far as his preaching. My sister says I have some of the same mannerisms and the same speech patterns that he does, and uh, I'm happy for that. He was, he was a good preacher and uh, was responsible for a lot of people uh, being converted. And uh, when he passed away in uh, 1991... Uh, there in Waterford, Michigan, the church building was absolutely full and running over with people that he had known all his life. So he really is one of my heroes. Well, great. Um, I'm, you know, I have uh, my father influencing as well, and right. I know how important a uh, uh, Christian father can be to, uh, to a man and to, to his family. Right. So, uh, Let's take a look at the next one here, picture. Fred Dennis. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Brother well, Dennis? Well, I remember Fred Dennis growing up more than anything else because Brother Fred Dennis preached all up and down the Ohio Valley for years and years and years. That's what he did. He was a traveling evangelist. And where Dad was located, we always had Fred Dennis in for a meeting, and so he always stayed with us. And uh, he was a very interesting character, uh, extremely well known in that area. And uh, in uh, 1981, after he had passed away, I had an opportunity uh, while I was there in Marietta with Brother Terry Varner, one of the local preachers there, to visit his widow. And she took us up to his study. And she said that, each, that Terry and I could each pick out a book and a uh, sermon chart from his library. And so we did, and I treasure, I treasure that very much. Um, as I said, uh, I, of course, I met him several times. Uh, I remember one time I, I was in a, uh, went to Williamstown, West Virginia, where he was in a meeting, and he recognized me. I was in college at the time. He recognized me, called me by name from the pulpit, and uh, said that my father, Jack, was a good preacher, and I always remember him for that. He also, uh, he married my uh, grandparents. Oh, before the right. ceremony years ago. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, John Hamilton. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Brother, Brother Hamilton? Brother John Hamilton. Well, he and my family were 
closely tied in together uh, for many, many, many years. My dad preached at Woodsfield, Ohio from 1949 to 1952. Then uh, the next preacher that came in left, and then John Hamilton came to Woodsfield. So in that sense, he followed my dad. And they were fast friends. They fished together. Uh, they were together a lot. Eventually, John moved back up to Michigan where my dad was, so they, uh, they got to be together a lot. Uh, when John retired, uh, he was at Shadyside, Ohio, but they, he and his wife and daughter moved back to Massillon until he passed away. The, the, one of the things that I remember uh, about John is that when he was at Woodsfield, I was a student at Ohio Valley College, and uh, the two years I was there, he invited me to Woodsfield to preach when he was gone. And so I had opportunity to go back there uh, twice during uh, those two years to speak where he was. And then in, uh, later on, uh, the church at Woodsfield had their 150th anniversary, and they invited uh, all the preachers that they uh, were still alive back, and in my dad's place invited me, and John was there. So I got to see John. John, John was a good friend and very supportive of my ministry, and I'll never forget uh, the influence that he had. He was, he was speaking, I think it was, at Maslin one evening, and I heard, I got to hear him one night, but the night prior I got to hear a real prominent preacher who publishes a journal. I don't want to mention his name, but I heard them both. I was looking forward to hearing them both, and I told my father, I said, that editor, he does a good job, but boy, John Hamilton, yeah. he's a powerful preacher. He's, John was an excellent preacher. He's very Excellent good. man. Yep. Well, let's take a look at the next one here. Uh, Neil Pryor. You have to tell him a little bit about Brother Pryor. Neil Pryor was at Harding University when my wife and I went there. And uh, he was a teacher in the Bible department there. A brilliant man. A brilliant man. And a wonderful Bible teacher. Matter of fact, he was my favorite Bible teacher while at Harding. I had him for a number of courses. And uh, his wife happened to be the sponsor for the social club that my wife was in, so we got to become pretty good friends with them. And uh, he, uh, he taught an Old Testament uh, course on the Pentateuch that I had, as well as several other courses. And he just had a way of connecting with the students uh, in his class that I have always appreciated. Uh, later on, he uh, was a dean before he passed away, and uh, he had a profound influence on me uh, in, in, my, in my teaching and in my ability to uh, uh, especially teach the Old Testament, and I appreciated him so much. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. Brother Gus Nichols. Now, you tell him about Gus Nichols. He was a very fascinating individual. As Brother well. Gus Nichols was uh, an old time gospel preacher. As you can tell, he was born in 1892, but he did a lot of his, a lot of his work in uh, in the South. But uh, I, I got a chance to to meet and hear Brother Nichols on more than one occasion, and he was a man of Scripture. That man could quote Scripture like I've never seen anybody quote Scripture. That's what he preached was just Scripture. And uh, I've always, I always enjoyed listening to him. And uh, he wrote a book on the Holy Spirit that I have that uh, I received a lot of, of good from. And I also have a debate that he had in my possession. So uh, his, his writing, and especially his ability to quote Scripture, always impressed me very, very much. And... Uh, I've always tried uh, to, to memorize what I can. My father was great at memory work, and that memory work was emphasized much more in the early years when preachers were beginning to train and go out into the ministry than I think is today. Oh, I'm sure it is. A lot, lot of interesting stories about Brother Nichols. I can remember one being told about when he went to the doctor and he was having some heart trouble, and the doctor said, well, you need to you know, you're spending so much time preaching, you need to, that's hard on your heart. You need to, you need to develop a hobby, something that you enjoy doing. And he'd say, well, I enjoy preaching. And he said, well, okay, then you need to do this. And, and every answer, 
uh, Brother Nichols would say, well, I enjoy preaching. And the doctor finally just said, well, you should just keep on preaching. <laughs> absolutely. And he did till he died. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look at this one. This, a lot of people think of these two together. Yes, Guy Brother Guy and Woods. Woods. Yes, Brother Guy and Woods. Uh, they were together a lot. Brother Woods, by training, was a lawyer, but he never practiced. Uh, but he was a brilliant scholar, a brilliant Bible student. And I, I got to hear him preach on more than one occasion. He spoke a lot at Freed Hartman University on their lectures. He conducted the open forum there for many years. And the man had a recall of Scripture that was almost beyond belief. But the biggest influence that he had on me was through his writings, uh, especially the commentaries that, uh, that he wrote and just the way that he could uh, bring Scripture to life. And I, I have several books that he wrote in my library and I consult him a lot when I'm preparing a sermon for a class. Uh, his writings mean a great deal to me. He was simply just an outstanding uh, preacher and uh, a scholar. He never preached very long. Uh, at any at any time, he said what he had to say, and, and he was done. Uh, I remember one time when he was preaching in uh, Camden Avenue, uh, Parkersburg, and the local preacher there, Charles Pugh, and then Brother Terry Varner, uh, asked him where he wanted to go. He said, I would like to go to uh, see uh, Bethany, where Alexander Campbell lived. And so they took him to Bethany. And uh, Terry told me one time that when they went to the grave of Alexander Campbell, Brother Woods wept openly. And then they decided to go back home, and they asked Brother Woods, where would you like to eat lunch? He said, what, what would you like to have for lunch? He said, I'd like to have a Big Mac and hot chocolate. So they stopped at a McDonald's. <laughs> I thought that was strange. But anyway, that was Brother, that was Brother Woods. He had a, like I said, his writings influenced me a lot. Well, I never, I never had the opportunity to meet Brother Woods. It seems like I might have had the opportunity to hear him one time, and, but it's hard to remember because you see video of him right. and uh, all that. But right. it, it, when you talk about Brother Woods and, and Brother Nichols, you know, a lot of the people you mentioned, you know, I, I never knew, but they wrote right. and, and they published and they. And they, 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 sometimes when you talk about commentaries, sometimes people have a negative view of commentaries. But they won't hesitate to go up and ask some guy, yeah. ask me, what do you think about this passage? Right. And I'm like, well, you know, I've studied here or there. But, but if, you could ask, if you could ask someone like Gus Nichols or someone like Guy in Woods or you know, some, you know, Brother Pryor or these different ones, would you like to go ask them what they think about this passage? Oh, I would love to be able to do that. Well, they wrote a commentary on that right, passage. Right, absolutely. Once. Go read absolutely. it. Absolutely. So, yeah, sometimes, our, uh, sometimes we get that a little uh, right. distorted. But uh, right. yeah, Guy in Woods was, um, I actually was at the Gospel Advocate uh, with Brother Anderson. He was the publisher, owner of the Advocate right. at the time. And, uh, and I told him that I really admired Guy in Woods. And he told me, he said, he said, come with me. And he took me back and he walked me into an office. And he said, this is Brother Woods' office. Basically, it was, it, it was his son's office, uh, Brother Anderson's son. He said, this is basically, he said, my son had this office, but he had so much respect for Guy and Woods that basically all the books on the shelf, he said, they're all Guy and Woods. Wow. They're all the way he had them. And, you could, and he let me look around and, and all that. And it was, it was really nice. They had a lot of respect for Guy and Woods yes. as the advocate. And Our brotherhood had a great deal of respect for him, and he did a lot of good during his lifetime. And like, like you said, his writings are what have really influenced me. And he said one time that his own personal writing style was uh, patterned after Moses Lard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have some of Lard's work, and I can understand how that took place. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at another one here. This is one of your instructors from the master's program. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Thomas B. Warren? Brother Tom Warren, I met, uh, I had met him earlier when I was at Waverly, and I have always had an interest in apologetics, Christian evidences uh, that started uh, at Ohio Valley. And he came to uh, Harding Graduate School of Religion in Memphis. And while I was at Waverly, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Memphis and study in the field of philosophy of religion and Christian apologetics. And that was the field that Dr. Warren uh, specialized in. 
He received his doctorate from Vanderbilt University, and I never will forget one time in class, he said that he was the only person in all his classes that believed in God. So that's the kind of atmosphere that he was in at the time. But uh, I spent two years there uh, in school, taking a lot of the courses there under him. He, too, had a mind that was, was, was just brilliant. Uh, not only did he have a PhD, he had a Ph.D. in philosophy of religion, but he also had a master's degree in mathematics. Uh, he, was, he was sharp. And uh, he influenced me uh, probably as much as, uh, as anyone except maybe for my father because that was the field that I was really interested in. And I tell you, it was a, it was a treat as well as a chore to be in his classes. I remember uh, a class that I had that our final exam in that class was to go into his office one-on-one and he would uh, ask you something and you had to answer. And uh, that was almost scary. <laughs> uh, he also had three debates that I was able to attend. The first one was with Anthony Flew in Denton, Texas in 1976. Dr. Flew from England was probably the leading uh, atheistic philosopher of his day. Later on, before Dr. Flew died, he came to a belief in a supreme intelligence. Well, Brother Warren had already died before that time, and I often thought that if Brother Warren had been alive, he would have, might have been able to lead Dr. Flew to the truth. But uh, that was an overwhelming defeat for atheism. And then the second debate he had with Dr. Wallace Matson from University of California at Berkeley, that was in Tampa, Florida, on the existence of God. And then a third debate he had was uh, Dr. Barnhart from North Texas State on ethics. And I have those, uh, I have those books. And uh, he was a tremendous man. He was humble. Uh, he had this rich voice that carried well. And uh, he, was a, he was a great ping pong player. Sometimes uh, after class was over, we all go down to the basement and play ping pong. Nobody could beat him. Uh, and then uh, uh, after he passed away, why uh, Brother Charles Pugh and Brother Terry Varner and others started a, uh, a thing called uh, the Warren Christian Apologetic Center named after Dr. Warren, which tries to carry on his work. Uh, three main efforts, defending the existence of God, the deity of Jesus Christ, and the inspiration of the scriptures. And I will always remember the time that I spent with him and the tremendous influence that he had on my life and my work. One of my heroes. I can remember when I was a student at Free Hardman, Brother Warren was supposed to come and speak. And we were, and I, did, I didn't know who he was. I was, you know, real young. And I heard the name, and I, you know, I knew you know, he was definitely deserving of respect and all that. But I can remember being in a crowd of about 3,000 people, hmm. and they got up and they made the announcement that Brother Warren's health was such that he yeah. was not be, going to be able to be there. And you could hear the audience just, <sighs> yeah. they were so looking forward to hearing him. Right. Uh, so uh, I know I, I missed out on that opportunity to be able to hear him. Uh, Glenn, in the, in the little bit of time we have left, why don't you mention some other people that might have some influence? Well, on when I was a student at, a, at Ohio Valley, I, went, I wasn't sure if I wanted to preach full-time when I went to Ohio Valley. I had that in the back of my mind. But there was a Bible instructor there by the name of Brother Tom Gomer. And he, that, uh, after looking at him and being with him and sitting under his teaching, one of the best Bible teachers I had, uh, he was interested in Christian evidence. So that kind of piqued my interest. Uh, and he, ha he really had a big influence on me deciding to preach. I helped him move his library one time, and as payment he took me to, uh, I think, Marietta College. They were having a book sale, and he bought me a couple of books that I wanted. So uh, I've tried to keep up with him. He's now in Texas, and he's not in the best of health, but he really had an influence on my life. Terry Varner, Charles Pugh, many of uh, whom are known in Churches of Christ, they've all had a big influence on my life, and I'll never be able to uh, thank them enough for that influence. Well, Glenn, it's been great to have you in the studio, and the gospel meetings are outstanding, and really appreciate you coming in and making these available to others to see, and you are able to influence them uh, through these, and hopefully you'll get to see some benefit from that as well. So thank you very much. Well, for thank you me. for having me. I've enjoyed uh, this very much, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity of being here and being on the program. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thanks for watching our program.
Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.